Hi guys, um, this is Isaac again. Apologies for um, this paper coming slightly later in the week. Um, we're not quite sure what happened with um, Monday and Tuesday's papers. There's a bit of confusion over who'd be recording those. So once we work out whether they have been recorded or haven't been recorded, they'll be made available to you at least by the end of this week. Um, I wasn't able to do them the last two days because I've had job interviews for next year, but I'll certainly be, be back with today, Wednesday's paper being recorded now. And then tomorrow's paper should be available, if not tonight, by early tomorrow morning, uh, by tomorrow morning. Um, so yeah, let's get cracking. Again, this is a multiple choice paper. It's going to follow the format, the other masterclasses I've been doing, whereby I'll be talking through the questions on the paper, um, the 30 multiple choice questions, highlighting the answer, and then kind of giving some of the explanations to why that's the answer, the ways you can work it out and the logic behind the question. And then if you, ha- this will only be brief, but if you have any further questions on these, to- on, on, kind of the questions or any of the concepts that's come up, please do message me. I know there's some outstanding questions from last week that I haven't yet had a chance to get to. And last time I haven't had, yet had a chance to get to, but I will get to those, uh, if not by the end of today, by tomorrow. Um, so yeah, let's get, let's get cracking. So we'll start with question, question one. The question one is asking again, what will, we've had, to, what you'll start to notice, actually, I'll make this point because I've, I've noticed this by going through a lot of the papers and talking to you about them is that the same questions or the same types of questions seem to start cropping up. So what you should slowly start to be doing as you're going through these papers is working out the areas they really like to to ask on. So you'll see questions who is going to really, kind of going to find very familiar. There's all, nearly always a question with the PP, uh, a, P, a production pos- uh, possibility curve, a PPC. And the same types of questions get asked about it all the time. So if you can really nail down the answer to those questions, they're really ways that you can make sure you're maximizing your marks in this paper. So you should start to notice these patterns now, and then that should help you really focus your learning and focusing your revision as well. So on that note, we're looking at question one, which, will, which asks, what will encourage a higher degree of division of labor? So what we're trying to think is, like, where is a division of labor going to have benefit for a firm? So we've been given four options, and the answer is C, but let's just look at the other two options first. We've got firms wishing for a greater level of self-sufficiency. Not necessarily kind of division of labor isn't really going to help self-sufficiency. Division of labor is... Uh, for any of you, any any of you who aren't particularly aware of this, is when you split up a production process into various different tasks. So, for example, in the making of a car, you might split it into the individual who puts the wheels on the car, the person who builds the chassis, the person who builds the bodywork, etc. And people can therefore get more specialised, and they're able to become more productive. Given that, it's very clear the answer is C. It raises productivity. The reason for that is because people get better at doing their own job. And that way you can produce more by having this kind of division of labor production line type mentality. So firms wishing to raise their level of productivity is why we'd encourage more division of labor. Question two shows the country's production possibility curve. And we're looking at this movement here from M from M to N in the long run. So notice that we're not obviously this wouldn't be possible in the short run. You're not really able to. um, to move outside the bounding of your production possibility curve, that represents the maximum productive um, efficiency you can. So end is not going to be possible short run, but in the long run, we can move to that position. So how are we going to jump our PPC essentially from here out to N? So it, it now goes through N. Well, or N is now on either on it or on the inside. Well, the only way to do that is to kind of increase productive capacity in the economy. So let's look at the options here that they give us. So increase in consumer spending are not going to increase productive capacity. An increase in demand for exports also isn't going to really increase capacity. We're looking at things that are going to make this economy able to produce more quantity of good X and more quantity of good Y. Uh, and what's going to do that is very clearly the increase in government spending on pensions. No, that's not really going to help, but an increase in investment certainly is. Investment is going to make these factories able to produce more, maybe provide buy more capital, more businesses, etc. That's really going to be an important step in shifting our PPC and allowing the economy to move from M to M. Question three asks us which statement about facts of production is correct. So what do we understand facts of production to be? Well, facts of production are things that we input in order to produce something. So we're talking labor, we're talking capital. Normally, we might talk about land, but that probably comes under capital. Essentially, we're talking capital and labor. Well, what do we know about them? Well, they all can earn income, certainly. So by having this productive capacity and having these factors of production, you're able to get money. So you, the person who owns them gets money, either through rent or through wages. If you own labor, you can you can get paid or they can work for you and produce goods for you, which you can then sell. But all facts of production can earn income for their owner. That's certainly the case. 
The fact that labour only involves physical effort, C, is quite an interesting one and one that a lot of you might be keen to go with. But we know that labour doesn't always involve physical effort. Effort, labour can be like mental. So people employ individuals to work in particular kind of non um, productive, physically productive jobs, but jobs that still require them to produce value and create products. But they're doing it sitting at a computer, for example. So it's not just about physical effort. And none of the others are particularly are particularly true about vertical production aren't uh, and they're not tempting. Question four. So a website compares the price of groceries. Which function of money is illustrated by this? So what do we think about when we're using this this price of money to compare prices? Well, we're clearly looking at money as being a unit of account here, right? Money is used to denote a certain amount of money, and you can use that to compare. It's not being denoted. Money here isn't storing value. It's not being kept on the bed or in a bank account. It's not really a standard of the third payment either, and it's certainly not a medium of exchange. It is simply an accounting unit. So how much is a good worth? Well, it's worth three pounds compared to a three pound fifty for another good. Question five. Here we get, we're told that it is expected that the price of gold rings will increase in the future. Which diagram shows the impact this expectation is likely to have on demand for gold rings in the present period? So let's have a look. So we've got this point that is going to rise. So we need the price to go up. So clearly A is an option. The price does increase. Here we have the um, price going down by moving along there. So it definitely can't be that. Can it be here? Well, no. We don't really know what's going on to price of gold rings. D is a really strong option simply because we know at every point of, of um, quantity there, the price of gold rings has gone up. So the price of gold rings is going up across the board. Here is a very specific increase in the price of gold rings. We're shifting along one demand curve. Here our demand curve has shifted outwards. So at every single quantity level, we've got that increase in price. And that's what they mean by this um, dem- impact on demand. It's not going to be a, a, shift, a, a smooth um, movement out. It's going to be an increase in, in demand there as the price goes up. Demand's going to shift downwards. So question six. Which combination of changes could leave the position of the demand curve for a normal good X unchanged? So what we're trying to say is we've got this normal good. And what do we mean by normal good? Well, it's a good that as the price increases, demand for it falls. It's got a normal price demand relationship. Quantity demand relationship. So what's going to leave the demand curve normal? So we need two changes, two combination, a combination of changes that's going to cancel each other out. So what's a decrease in taste for product X going to be? Well, it's going to be a fall in demand. And if you get a decrease in the quality of a product Y, you're going to see the uh, product Y for which good X is a complement. Then we're going to see um, demand for kind of good X increase. So maybe those would cancel each other out. So we'll put A as like an, as an option there. Sorry, a product X is a complement, not a substitute. So if product Y is decreased in the quality, then less people are going to demand Y. And we know that X is a complement, so less people are going to demand X. So here we've got a decrease in demand and then another decrease in demand. I apologize, I read complement as a substitute with you there. So A doesn't work. B, a decrease in the quality of a substitute and an increase in incomes. Well, an increase in incomes, given that it's normal good, as incomes go up, demand for it goes up. We're going to assume that that increases demand and a decrease in the quality of a substitute is also going to increase demand. So here we've got two demand increases. They're definitely not going to cancel each other out. C, an increase in the price of a substitute. Well, that's going to increase demand for for the good we're talking about. So that's an increase in demand. And an increase in population size is just going to mean more people demand it, right? So that's going to increase demand twice. So that's not going to cancel each other out. But by elimination, we know it's D. But let's just have a chat through D. An increase in the price of product Y, which product X is a complement. So if product Y goes up and product X is a complement of that, we're going to see demand for product Y fall. Therefore, demand for product X falls. They're complements. But we've also got a successful advertising campaign for product X, which is going to increase demand. So you've got a demand fall in and a demand rise, and therefore they're going to cancel each other out. And therefore, it's going to leave the demand curve unchanged. Seven, a product has a normal demand curve and a normal supply curve. So we're back the same. That just means they're posit- positively sloping supply curve and a negatively sloping demand curve. But we'll, that just basically means what we normally do. What would explain a rise in the price of the product and a fall in the quantity of the product traded? So if you have what we're looking for is a, sh- a series of shifts that are going to that, that are going to kind of result in this rise in price and fall in quantity. 
So basically, we're looking for a supply, a, a shortage where supply is low, but price is high. So we need a, a, basically let's be less supply than there is, is an increase in demand than there is demand. So we're expecting there to be equilibrium. So what happens here? Decrease in demand is double the decrease in supply. No, nope. you get a decrease in demand. You're going to have a surplus. You've got more supply because the decrease is double and demand is double and not enough demand for it. So that's not going to do it. We're looking for a, 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 short, a, a shortage, a short, a, sorry, a shortage in supply. Remember. Decrease in supply, double the decrease in demand. Yeah, that's a massive fall in demand, right? And though some demand has fallen, it's not fallen by as much. So we are going to have a shortage. That's going to increase the price. And, sh and because there's less supply, we're going to see in the fall of the quantity of product traded as well. Because they're both moving in that direction. The others are going to increase the quant quantity of the product traded, maybe by less in some cases. And the price trade, the way that the price moves will depend on whether it's increasing, if the increase in supply or demand is bigger relative to the increase in the other. So we know it's got to be A and B, and it's, it's, it's obviously B in this case. We need to get through the, the logic of the problem. Question eight. The diagram shows how the quantity demanded of four goods changes as income changes. Which good has the income elasticity of demand, which is always plus one? What is a plus one el income elasticity of demand? Well, we know that that's a unitary elasticity. So we're looking for a straight line, a constant, and it's very clear that it's C. So that's a very straightforward, nice, straightforward question. Know your unitary elasticities and what they look like. Straight lines, constant. Question nine. The cross elasticity of demand between bus travel and rail travel is plus two. OK, so that's important. What does that mean? Well, it means, well, a rise in the price of bus fares caused the demand to move by 10 percent. So what are we looking for if it's plus two? Well, if the demand for all for rail travel increased by 10 percent, then we're expecting to see a rise in the price of bus fares increase um, by 5 percent. OK, so what is 5 percent of we know we're looking for a 5 percent increase. So which of these represents a 5 percent increase? That's a 10 percent increase. Three of 30 to 33 of the increase of three of 30. So we're looking for percentage change of five because we know that it rose by 10 percent and that's plus two so we're looking for half that figure five so 40 to 45 five is not five percent of 40 in the case of this 10 60 that's 20 percent it's too big 20 to 21 one is five percent of 20 so therefore that is an increase of five percent the answer is a so here is relying on two things one you're understanding what happens in cross elasticity of demand one being able to calculate what the rise in the price should be given this increase in 10 percent so it's got to be a five percent rise and then being able to spot which of these is a five percent rise from 20 cent to 21 cent is a five percent rise so that's three part problem it's pretty tricky and one that you need to make sure you get all the parts on if you're not clear on any of those parts please please do let me know and we'll go through question by and again in more detail i think it's probably one of the trickier questions on the paper for some people right this is also another slightly tricky question. Again, they've kind of ramped up the level of the elasticity questions here because they're now introducing numbers into the equation. This is something they might do. So you've got to not just be comfortable with the notion of the elasticity and the concept, but also how this then plays out in numerical problems. So here we've got a supply function. Question 10, we've got a supply function for a good, which can be written as Q equals 2P plus 10. That means when the price is 2, for example, the quantity supplied is 2 times 2, 4 plus 10, so you've got 14 supplied. That makes sense. So we see that there's a price rise from 10 to 15 dollars per kilo. So what we want to know is if that's a 10, that's a 50 percent rise, right? 10 dollars to 15 dollars is a 50 percent rise. What's what's the percentage increase in price in in quantity related relative to that? And then we know the price elasticity of supply. So we're going to expect to be positive because it's uh, normal good. Normally, we'd expect when price goes up, supply goes up. So it's a positive relationship. So right, let's think. What what is what we're going to have to do is input both these numbers in as p. And work out the change. So what's our quantity when it's 10? So that's 2p, 2 times 10 plus 10, that's 30. And when it's 15, it's 2 times 15, so 30 is 40. So we're going from um, a 30 to 40, so a 10 increase. That's a 33%, 33.3% increase, kind of two-thirds increase there. So where is our, in which which range does it lie in? Well, it's 33.333 recurring, two-thirds. So we're kind of looking that we know it's going to be between the two thirds to three quarters range. That's the only range which works there. So what they're relying on you doing is being able to realize that this is the this is an important equation, what this represents. 
input both your figures, get the change and work out the percentage change, because that's going to be what gives you the value of the price elasticity supply. Relative to a 10%, a, a um, sorry, a 50% uh, rise in price, how much has um, our demand risen? And the demand has risen by um, 30%. In that relation, so it's 3 over 5, and 3 over 5 is between these two numbers there. Cool. The diagram shows a market for, that's another complicated question and one I'm happy to go over again if some of you haven't quite followed the mathematics going on there. 11. The diagram shows a market for a good which is supplied partly from domestic production and partly from imports. So here we have this start diagram. So SH here, this line, is showing domestic supply. And SW is showing the world supply there. And we see domestic supply shift to SH1. So what's going to happen? So where's our consumption? So consumption here is going to be from O to V. It's going to be all of the all of the consumption in the economy is going to be where we really demand intersex world supply. But what we're looking for is where does domestic supply not match? So where on this or where on this world supply curve does domestic supply intersect? And then how much is the quantity that's going to be made up by imports via the world supply rate? And the point is that up to that point, SH has been supplying below the world supply rate, right? Between O and uh, T here, SH1 is a lower price of supply than the world supply rate, which is there, that price. But afterwards, it's above. So from point T to point V, it's going to be supplied at the uh, world supply rate, which means it's going to be imported. So we know that we've got an overall level of consumption O to V, which is where the demand curve intersects the world supply curve. But the amount imported is certainly going to be this V, this from V, the maximum point to this point T here, which is where the SH1 would intersect. Previously, to go over the logic here, the, you probably would realize now that under the old domestic supply, SH, not SH1, SH, the level of imports would have been more. You would have had imports from R, which is the point at which this domestic supply price, price supply that goes above the world supply price. From R to V would have been the old level of imports. So the level of consumption hasn't changed from O to V, but the level of imports has from R to V to T to V. So volume of imports is there. Question 12. This table shows the price Rashid is willing to pay, pay for successive cans of cola. So what we see here is his decreasing marginal kind of willingness to pay, his decreasing marginal value. So for the first can, he's willing to pay 90. For the second can, he's only willing to pay 80. The third can, he's willing to pay 65. And the fourth can, he's willing to pay 50 because he doesn't really care that much about the fourth can once he's got three and the same and so on. First can's the most, he gets the most utility from that. So if the price is 50 and Rashid buys four cans, what is the monetary value of Rashid's consumer surplus? So we know that Rashid has bought four cans, right, at 50. So we know that the price he's paid for all of these cans is 50. So what's his, his surplus is the difference between the price he was willing to pay and the price he actually paid. So on this first can, he spent 50, but he would have paid 90 cent. So what's his willingness to pay? Well, it's 0, 40. What's it here? Well, 0, 30. So 40 plus 30 is 70. And what's it here? 15. If we do 40, 30, 15 gives us 85. So we know that his monetary value of the consumer surplus is 85. What this paper is really interestingly doing that some of the other papers we've done haven't, some of the papers we've previously done haven't asked, is not only to use concepts like consumer surplus in a more simplistic conceptual way, like identifying the area of consumer surplus on a diagram and maybe the change, but really to apply numerical analysis to this. And that's something you do really need to be comfortable with. So it's one thing understanding the concepts, and then it's another understanding them enough that you can then integrate mathematical work with them. And that's something that I really want you guys to make sure you're happy on and ask any questions you might have about um, just to make sure you're really secure, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Question 13. In the diagram, the supply curve shows the number of spaces in a car park, and the demand curve shows the number of the, the demand for spaces on four different days. We've got D1, D2, D3, and D4. Who got demand? So demand clearly goes up on different days. The owner wishes to charge a parking fee on each of these days to allocate the space according to the market mechanism. Which one should he use? Well. If basically he wants to charge the parking fee the best, he always wants to charge at equilibrium. His supply is always the same, but demand changes. So he's going to, is he going to vary prices? Well, yes, he's going to have the best ways to vary the prices. And how is he going to vary them? Well, the best way he'd make money, according to the market measure, would be to charge the price of equilibrium on each day. So he's going to have to vary the price very clearly between P1 and P4. 
quite a simple question. Setting the price at P1 is going to work for D1, but you're not going to get as much money as you could have done on D, D2 to D4. Varying prices just between P2 and P3 works for those days, but doesn't capture the whole market on P4 or P1. Setting a fixed, fixed price doesn't work either, so we've got to vary these prices between P1 and P4 to really capture it. Use the market mechanism to allocate these spaces. Question 14. Which situation would indicate the presence of an externality? What is an externality? Well, it's when private private exchanges have costs or benefits associated with uh, people who are external to the economic exchange. So in this case, producers' actions causing a shortage of particular good. Nope, that's affecting people within the economic exchange. Private motorists contributing to traffic congestion in city centres. That's certainly true. The traffic and the private motorists are engaging in private benefits and costs and private action, yet their effect is having a cost to everyone else in the city, even if they aren't engaged in the economic exchange or the economic action of driving the car. Driving the car. So clearly there, there's an external, external cost there, and that's an externality. The other two won't work either. You should now be comfortable on the notion of externalities and identifying examples of them in these types of questions. How do we understand the term cost in a part 15? How do we understand the term cost in a public sector cost benefit analysis? Well, remember, this is the public sector. This is the important point here that we're looking at public sector costs. So how do we consider those? Well, the public sector is concerned with social elements. So we are looking at social costs there in a public sector cost benefit analysis. If this was a private sector, it would be private costs. This is one definition of American is the one that will be under consumed because of poor decision making. Who would usually be responsible for this poor decision making? Well, generally we assume it to be the consumers of the good. Because the point of a merit good is it's one that's under consumed here. So the trick here, the clue here is in that. Why are they under consumed? Often because it's a lack of information. A really good example of a merit good is something like vaccines. That we actually often see under consumption of vaccines because not every individual is aware of the long term benefits and wider benefits, external benefits that these might have of these merit goods. But the market on the social, um, Allocate here because the socially kind of optimal rate would be a higher consumption of vaccines than we actually see. So it's poor decision making on the part of the consumers. They're just not consuming the good. So that's that's kind of the under consumed and consumers of the good are kind of the, the key clue there. That's quite a straightforward question. Question 17. A local council charges for the use of tennis courts, but not for the use of streetlights. So how would you want to exchange that? Well, the use of streetlights can't be restricted. You can't really charge anyone for using streetlights because how do you know if they don't pay, how are you going to stop them using the streetlight, right? So this is kind of a, a very clearly a public goods question. The tennis courts can be what can be described as a club good or a private good. You can exclude people. You can put a lock on the door or a code is often used. Um, whereas a public good is not a public good like streetlights are non-excludable. You can't stop anyone using them. But that's how the economists would explain it. The, the, the streetlights represent something that's non-excludable. And therefore, the government can't charge for the use of them. The local council can't charge for the use of them. It's not really talking about luxury necessity. Maybe that's that's one reason for a kind of a social reason for not charging is that you don't need a tennis court, but you need streetlights. So it's wrong to charge for something that people need. Definitely not the case that tennis courts are worth more than streetlights. Um, that would explain the different price, maybe, but not 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 charging for the streetlights. The opportunity cost of using land to build tennis courts and not streetlights is not true. There's equal, maybe the opportunity cost to use tennis to build tennis courts is more because the amount of area they take up is bigger. The opportunity cost of using streetlights does exist anyway. So there is an opportunity cost. You can't use that little bit of pavement for something else, like a, maybe a sign or something. Right. Question 18. The government is considering building flood defences along a river. It has calculated the costs and benefits as follows. So here we've got our costs, private costs, next, private benefits. External costs, external benefits. According to the cost benefit analysis, which decision and reasoning about flood defense is correct? So do we want to build them or do we not want to build them? Well, here we can see that there's a really high private cost and very low private benefits. And perhaps the private benefits, the, the, and there are external benefits, but maybe they're not enough to, to kind of accept the private cost. Well, how do we really want to uh, think about this? Well, the question is that we're, we're really not not going to build it here because we're looking at social cost. And what is social cost? Well, it includes both private and external costs. So why are we not going to go ahead? It's because the, the total amount of cost is greater than the total amount of benefit. And the social thing is going to calculate all of it. So we're not going to go ahead and build it. So although perhaps the, the, there's more social benefit, there's more external benefit than external cost. And um, you could say you're not going to build it because the private cost is higher than the private private benefits. Well, the point we're trying to make here is that then when we talk about social costs and a cost benefit analysis, we're looking at both private and external. So we've got to take into account this figure here, the $510 million of cost there. 
And the benefits, although there's um, $450 million worth of benefits, that's not enough to really um, um, make these costs valuable. They're not. Remember, cost benefit and that's just a very simple. Are the costs bigger than benefits? We look at both there when we're considering social costs. Question 19. In the diagram, here we've got MN being a production possibility con uh, curve of a country that has comparative advantage in production of good Y. How can it get to R, which is offered? Well, we know the only way that a country that has a PPC there, where it has comparative advantage in Y, um, would be able to end up at a point R above its, its ability to produce all of either all of good Y or all of good X is going to be to trade. I am sorry about that. I'm going to stop the recording and come back to it.